grace and mercy and peace are ours through Jesus who gives us in baptism the greatest of all gifts by which we also come together today to meditate on his word. Let's start uh, with prayer. Lord Jesus, as you gave baptism to your church, as you commanded your apostles to go out to make disciples and to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit. So also you have given this gift to us. Help us today as we meditate upon our baptisms to be strengthened in faith and reminded of the greatest gifts that come to us through this precious blessing in water and in the promise of your word. Amen. Ranjit Chowdhury, if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, is a sewer man in Mumbai, India. That's not actually a picture of him, but I saw a video of him on BBC. And this is exactly a picture of what he does for a living. Cleansing Mumbai's sewers, working in them has to be the most vile and awful job that I can possibly think of on the face of this earth. And, and, and watching the video of him like almost made my stomach turn. But he doesn't really have a choice. He, he can't do anything else with his life because in India, he is part of the lowest of low castes in their caste system. He is one of the untouchables. And in India, where you are born... The caste you are born into predetermines your life for you. It determines the kind of education you'll get. It determines the kind of job you can get. It says who you'll be allowed to marry. It guides your place in society. And unfortunately for a man like Ranjit, this is the life that he was born into. And he can do literally nothing to change that. In fact, he's so ashamed by what he has to do for a living that he won't even tell his own family what he does for fear that they will, they will cast him out. And, and he was married for several years with his wife before he admitted to her what he does for his day job, cleaning the sewers in Mumbai. As people who live in Canada, we are frankly appalled by that kind of of inequality and injustice, aren't we? we? We pride ourselves in our country on holding people up in equality. But even though we, we still have this idea that all people should be equal, as we'll hear also in our text from Galatians today, we also have to admit that in, in, inequality is still the reality doesn't matter. Inequality is out there because we have this sliding scale by which we still judge people, good or bad, rich or poor, a national hero or cannon fodder. We, we think of people in these terms as we compare them to ourselves and our own pecking order in the social, in the social status. And even though our country might criticize and has publicly criticized India for their caste system, India can turn around and say to us, well, even though we have this idea that all people should be equal, we aren't even doing it ourselves. Paul, the apostle, wrote about inequality as he spoke to the Christians who lived in the churches of the region of Galatia. Because this was very much for them a, an issue, a forefront issue in their minds. And you could say that inequality is, this word inequality, is the reason why he had to write the book of Galatians in the first place. What was happening in these churches as people from different cultures and different contexts were coming together, they realized they also struggled with inequality. Their culture, their society like ours had the haves and the have-nots. It had 
issues between men and women. It had issues between those who were of Jewish background and those who were of Greek background or Asian background. They had all these same dynamics. And what was happening was that the Jewish Christians in Galatia began to think that they had a better culture, a better set of religious customs, which made them a little bit higher on the pecking order than everyone else. They looked with pride at the fact that Jesus himself was a Jew and that Jesus fulfilled all those Old Testament rituals that are commanded in the books of Moses. And so they thought, you know what? Because we have been given this rich tradition, everyone else should adopt our culture and our religious rituals in order to be saved by Jesus. But in doing that, they were hijacking the gospel and twisting it and making it something that it's not. And that is why Paul had to write this book that we call Galatians. To a large degree, Paul is writing this letter to deal with that inequality. But he's also writing it to us today to remind us that in Christ, as we talked about last week, being in Christ, we have perfect equality. An equality that comes to us ultimately in baptism. An equality that we don't deserve. And that's what Paul is getting at. Let's read our text and see exactly what he's trying to say. Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 to 29. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. These verses right here in Galatians chapter 3 are the go-to place when people want to talk about equality within the Christian church. I'm sure you've heard them used that way before. In fact, they are the very opposite of everything that the Indian caste system says. And so as Canadians, we're like, yeah, that's awesome. These verses are talking about equality. That means all of us here are on the same, on the same status level. We're all, we can all look at each other and say we are equal. In fact, Paul uses words that speak of this equality. He says, you are all children of God. You are all one. In Christ Jesus. But even though equality is the ideal, it's still not the reality. I was reminded of this this week as my brother and his family were visiting and they wanted to see a little bit of Vancouver. So on Tuesday, we took them downtown to see Gastown because they wanted to see that. And then they thought, oh, let's walk over to Chinatown. Now, if you've done that, you know that you have to walk through East Hastings. So we did. We started walking through East Hastings, and I'm quickly reminded of how this status, how status matters, because as our party started walking through, we started walking a little bit faster and avoiding encountering some of the people on the street, people who might be high on drugs, people who are just yelling weird or obscene things. And I have to admit, perhaps you as well, how would I respond? How would I react if one of those people, addicted to drugs, living on the street, walked into our church? Would I treat them as an equal brother or sister in Christ, especially if they said, I desire the same baptism that you have? As long as as status, the way that we view others in that pecking order of society matters, as long as it helps to form our identity, then, yeah, it, it is a problem, isn't it? In some ways, we have a status that's given to us at birth that we have no way of 
determining for ourselves. You cannot choose if you are born a man or a woman. You don't get to choose what race you are. You don't get to choose what language you speak or what nation you're born into or who your parents are. You get to choose none of these things, and yet they do play a large role in determining our status. But we also have status that we achieve, accomplishments that that give us a status in the world around us. How were your grades in school? How do the other moms look at you at the park, the way your children are behaving? How does your boss like you? How gifted are you at the things that you've worked so hard to achieve? You know, as you think about those questions, you think, yeah, those things do matter to my status. It does matter to me what other people think of me. And even though we might say we have equality as Christians, that still doesn't change the fact that I feel judged by the way people view my status. For example, you could not pay me enough to go walk down to the piano like Scott was earlier and sit down and play a hymn in front of you all. I would never do it. Even though I can sort of play piano, I would never do it because I wouldn't impress you and I would feel very judged. What I'm doing though when I have that attitude in my heart, as we all do, is I'm setting up this little idol that makes my status as a piano player or whatever important to me to this extent that if it gets knocked down, I feel crushed. I feel embarrassed. I have lost face. I feel shame. Let me give you a a good example of this. Sergei Rachmaninoff, who some would argue is the best piano player ever to have lived, and you can go on YouTube and listen to him actually play, even though it's almost 100 years ago. Uh, And and he, he wrote some of the best scores that are out there. James invited us back in February to listen to a piano concerto by Rachmaninoff at his concert. Now, I learned a little bit about Rachmaninoff since that concert, and I learned that Rachmaninoff almost didn't compose anything that he wrote because after he wrote his very first symphony, he got such a scathing review from another musician that he went into deep depression for over three years and didn't write anything. Why? Because he had set up for himself his identity as a composer. And that critique was so so crushing, knocking down the idol of his own heart, of who he was as a composer, that he felt he couldn't continue. Now thankfully he did, and we got to listen to that beautiful concert back in February. But what if he never came through that? When we set up and make our status the idol of our heart, the identity that that forms who we are as a person, whether it's through our, our grades in school, our ability as a parent, the way we do our job, the culture we come from, whatever it might be, We are putting our identity in something other than in Christ. And this is the way the world works. This is the way of the world. To find your identity in something about yourself apart from Jesus. The problem is is that as soon as your identity is in something other than Jesus, you feel you need to justify it. You need to compare yourself to others to see, am I doing a good enough job or aren't I? And then even though we hear Paul speaking to us and saying we are all equal in Christ, suddenly other Christians become competition for us. And we view them with, we view them with suspicion because what if they're judging us? What if they're not as good at us at something? See, even if a, a Christian might come to you and say, I just want to encourage you. You might take those words and say, that, is, that person's judging me. I'm not a good enough, gifted enough musician. I'm not a good enough parent. I'm not strong enough at, at serving my Lord. And this is exactly what the devil wants. He wants us to build these idols of identity in our heart 
putting ourselves into something other than Christ that are easily toppled, easily crushed when our pride is hurt. I think that having this thought in mind helps us to see just how amazing it is that Jesus, who has an identity that far surpasses us, a status that far surpasses every person ever to have lived and who ever will live. I mean, Jesus had a status that no one can compare to. He was the Son of God. If he wanted to, Jesus could have flaunted his status before all the people of his day made himself to be a great king or some great figure who we all would, would bow down to and say, look at how great he is. None of us are on, on a par with him. But Jesus does the opposite of what the world expects and does, doesn't he? He had untouchables in his day as well. People who were so shameful that you would, you would walk on the other side of the street to avoid them the way we did walking through East Hastings. The tax collectors, the prostitutes, the sinners. He ate with them. He sat with them and treated them as equals. Now this, of course, infuriated Jesus' enemies. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they despised Jesus for doing this very thing. And in fact, that was one of the main reasons why they wanted to condemn him. Because he wouldn't flaunt his righteousness, his status. Instead, he humbled himself. We hear in the book of Matthew that this was the ultimate reason why they did condemn him. When the, the Caiaphas, the high priest, uh, asked Jesus. He said, tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. You have said so, Jesus replied. But I say to all of you, from now on you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. What is Jesus doing in these verses? He's acknowledging, first of all, that He is the Son of God. He didn't hide that. He was very bold about saying that. He's the Son of God. And that status as God's Son does put Him on a different plane than all of us lowly, untouchable sinners. And yet, He does exactly what Caiaphas and the chief priest sentenced Him to do. He dies for us. Lowers Himself beneath the status that we as untouchable sinners have to die on the cross. And then, of course, he rose. Ascended into heaven. Sits at God's right hand and tells Caiaphas and all those people who were judging him then that he has a relationship with our eternal Father, a status far above, the, far above anything else that when they see him, they will see him coming again in judgment. Jesus could have flaunted that status, couldn't he? But instead of flaunting it, Galatians 3, the verses we're looking at, tell us that Jesus wants to share it, to share his identity with us. That's what he's coming to do. To give us a new identity. The same one that he has as the Son of God. That Paul says in our lesson, he uses those words, that we are now children of God. Children of God and heirs of heaven. Those aren't just fluffy terms that sound nice. God calls you his child, equal to Christ, an heir of heaven. Can you think of anything better than having that kind of status? If you were, say, heir to the throne in England... That would be a significant status. And you'd be on TV just like all the other British royals, wouldn't you? But God says you are heir to heaven itself. The greatest and highest status that we can possibly imagine. And all the blessings that go with that belong to us through Christ. 
Let's read these words of Paul one more time. But this time, as we're reading them, listen carefully to how Paul says you get this new status, this new identity in Christ. Paul writes, So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. The answer to that question, how does this new status, this new identity become ours? In baptism, Paul says it's being clothed with Christ. Being clothed in His righteousness. Today, literally today, this morning, was the end of the, the biggest bike race in the world, the Tour de France. And the, one who, the rider who won this year was a British rider named Chris Froome. And for three weeks of grueling bike riding over mountains and avoiding crashes, what is his prize? A yellow polyester shirt. All of that work, all of that pain, and he gets to wear a yellow polyester shirt, but he wears it with glory, as you can see in his face. This is literally a picture I took off the internet this morning. Imagine for a minute that it's Judgment Day. And there you are, standing on the winner's podium. Not of just a bike race, but of the human race. The race of life. Before all the people of the world. There you are standing. And Christ puts around you, not some yellow polyester shirt, but the robe of righteousness. The victory robe. One by which all people will say, look at how honored and glorified this person is. To be standing there with Christ. To be an heir of heaven. To stand before God forever. What prize could you think of that could compare to this moment? Now, there is a big difference between Chris Froome's victory in Paris and your victory on Judgment Day. See, he earned his victory. But the victory that we receive, Christ puts on us. We had nothing to do with it. This is what we get in baptism, isn't it? A new status with God that is so amazing that no one, no glory, nor amount of status here on earth can compare to the moment that you will get when you stand on that winner's podium on Judgment Day. God Himself giving you praise and glory. Looking at your life and saying everything you did, every deed was perfect because of what Jesus did and what He gave you. See, in baptism, we receive all of these amazing blessings from God that, that unite us. Just as you've seen on our, our bulletin covers the last month and a half, all of these blessings coming together so that one day we stand before God and they're all ours. The one God whom we worship puts His name on us. And calls us, as Paul says here, his children. Meaning we're part of his one family. We're part of this one body of Christ. The hope that we all share. Coming to fulfillment on that great day. One faith that we have in Jesus. Leads to this moment that we long for and we look forward to. And we already possess Because of what Jesus has done. Our faith in that one Lord who gives us his one spirit in baptism. And the one Father whom we all worship and call our own because of what Jesus has done. And we start to see that the blessings that God has given us. This status that we receive in baptism goes beyond anything that we could possibly imagine. 
any status that we could achieve in this world, any status we've received because of the family we were born into or the way we look. But what we notice in baptism is that Jesus doesn't just give it to us, not just to you and not just to me, but he gives it to everyone, to all of us who are in faith, washed and cleansed in those baptism waters. And what that does is it changes the way that we look at everyone else who is a Christian and gives us this real equality that can't exist anywhere else outside of Jesus. You see, baptism lifts up even a person who might be considered untouchable by a society and lifts that person up to be an heir of heaven. Baptism lifts up the mom who feels judged so that she is no longer judged and God vindicates her. Baptism raises up even those of us who might have worldly status and worldly honor so that we look at what we have as so-called status and honor here and consider it worthless, untouchable. Because nothing can compare to what Jesus has given us by putting on us his robe of righteousness, his holiness. So how does that change the way we look at other Christians? Doesn't that enable us to look at them and see exactly what Paul is talking about here? That we truly are brothers and sisters? That we're all one in equality, in status before God? Paul isn't saying that we stop being men or we stop being women. That we stop having a nationality or a culture. Or that we suddenly escape from the economic system that we live in. No, those things might still continue. Our achievements in this world might still be there. But now we no longer look at them as being the foundation of our identity. Instead, we look at Jesus. And we look at the baptism that he has clothed us in. And it changes the way that we want to treat each other, doesn't it? We want to look at each other and and treat each other as truly being brothers and sisters, equals in Christ. We want to look at our little ones, little children, who perhaps they interrupt our service crying but need to be taken out for a moment. But they're still our brothers and sisters, and we want them here. It changes the way that we look at people who have a different culture. It says, I want to build bridges and relationships with them so that they understand this oneness that we have in Christ. It changes the way we look at our own role in the Christian church. Realizing that even though God has gifted us differently, No one is better or worse than anyone else. We are all equal because of baptism. And it's this very baptism that changes the way we do missions too. Today, our church body actually has at least three solid churches and and perhaps dozens more that we can't know about because of safety in India. Over 6,000 people are going to our missions in India, a country of 1.27 billion, I think. And these Christians have found in baptism, in Christ, this same new status with God that lifts them up. Unsurprisingly, many of the people who are Christians in India belong to the lower castes, or even untouchables. And even though the rest of India might look down on them and treat them like dirt, they know in Christ, God has lifted them up to be heirs of heaven, our own brothers and sisters in faith. And one day we're going to stand with these people in glory, embracing them as we embrace each other. Dear friends, I hope that as we have seen in This sermon series, God has made us one. So may we finally see in baptism that we all have this 
one beautiful identity in Christ, this one status that we've received in baptism, and one hope that all of us can share together in Christ Jesus. Amen.